within minutes, their whole world will collapse. At the same time, Stanley Pramuth, whose office in the South Tower was destroyed when the second plane hit, is struggling to free himself from the wreckage. All the partition, all the walls and everything was flattened. Every piece of furniture and computer was all destroyed. And I'm screaming, and I'm thinking, God, how can these people be so heartless to leave me to die? How can they do that? Not realizing that I'm by myself on this floor. There's nobody else. Nobody. Upon impact, everybody in the 78th to the 82nd floor was gone. A few floors above Stanley, several executives from a brokerage firm are struggling to find their own escape route. Miraculously, they find a stairwell that seems to be undamaged by the plane crash. As they were going down this group of six longtime colleagues, they met an obese woman and a frail man coming up. And the obese woman said, you can't go down, there's too much smoke, there's too much fire. At the 82nd floor in the darkened stairwell, they debated what to do. Most of them went up in search of a helicopter rescue on the advice of the people who were coming below. But there was one executive and executive vice president named Brian Clark. He just felt down was the place to be. I heard off to the side this banging, bang, 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 help. This faint voice was screaming, but it was faint. Help, is anybody there? I can't breathe, help, I'm buried. Now the, the fire escape door had blown off the wall a bit on the 81st floor landing. So we were able to push the drywall back. Ron and I went shinnied sideways through this opening in the wall and onto the 81st floor. And the smoke was picking up a bit on the 81st floor. And with my flashlight, as I sort of shot it around this darkness, because it was pitch black in there, my flashlight was like a high beam headlight on a foggy country road at night. All you could see was this beam of light in this, the, the, the dust that was kicking up in the air in the black smoke. Hang in there! But Prime is beyond Clark's reach, and time is running out. This man that had the flashlight, shining it over his head, I could see this light just beaming through, and you know, all around, and he's flashing it. And this stranger's voice was guiding us left and right as we approached him. And then a very strange thing happened. Ron Francesco, who was carrying a gym bag, he was using it somehow to filter the air as best he could. And he started coughing and sputtering and was completely overcome by smoke right beside me. He couldn't go on. And he turned around and he went back to the stairs and he went up. You okay? Ahead of me a few yards, I don't know yet, I haven't found this stranger who's screaming for help, is somebody who's saying, help, I can't breathe. And yet, right there, around me, was this bubble of fresh air. And I cannot explain it, other than miraculous. Inside the damaged office, Stanley Prameth tries to find his way through the mountain of debris. And unknown to either Stanley or Brian Clark, they are drawing closer and closer to disaster. At the time, the idea that the World Trade Center towers could fall seemed impossible. But as the whole world knows, the towers did fall. And the images of destruction from that terrible day beg the question, how could anyone inside the buildings have survived? Out of the devastation of the September 11th terrorist attacks, a new image of heroes has emerged. Police, firefighters, and rescue workers of all kinds showed amazing courage on that day. But they were not the only people fighting to save the lives of strangers. Inside the South Tower, Stanley Prameth struggles to free himself from a mountain of debris, when suddenly a light pierces through the smoky darkness. And as I'm screaming, Lord, send somebody, anybody to help me. There's this person with a flashlight on the other end of the floor. I can't see the person, but there's this flashlight. I gotta be dreaming here. Something is not right. What are the chances for somebody to have a flashlight at a time like this? I've gotta be dreaming. So I'm crouched and I'm screaming, don't leave me to die. But I'm temporarily deaf because of this sound. 
And even though this person was responding, later on, I knew, I, I couldn't figure it. And I'm thinking, all these people who were with me left me to die. This time, everybody was gone and in back, and I'm by myself. And I decided that I'm going to crawl as fast as I could from the south end of the building going towards the elevator. One floor is like one acre square, I would say. And I'm crawling as fast as I can. Wait for me, please don't leave me. And I'm crawling the entire length of the loans department through the lounge into the computer room, into the communication room. And there's this wall. Somehow this stranger had come through a maze, if you like, but now was trapped by a wall. As I got closer and closer, and he was directing me left, right, and I got there. And not two yards in front of me was this hand waving that I suddenly was able to focus on and went down the arm and there was a wide-eyed stranger with his head sort of sticking out a hole in the wall saying, you know, you know this, is, this is me. I'm gonna have to go to this wall. I'm gonna see if I can't go to the wall. Okay, I'm gonna climb it over the top. So I climbed up in some debris and, and sort of went up over the top and looked down and said, the only way out of here is if you go up and over this. Now, you know, this person scrambled up and like a cat almost, but and I reached but couldn't catch it. I said, now you must do this. This is the only way out trying to grab on on top of this 10 feet cheese rock wall. It's like a drywall, partition wall, sort of, that I missed. And part of the ceiling caved in and a black sheet rock screw, trying to prevent it from hitting my face, I raised up my hand, it went straight through and got stuck on the other side. And I'm now in a worse shape than before. So I winced, the man says, what happened? I said, there's a nail in my palm. He says, bite it out. I says, I can't do it. He said, is it attached to a piece of wood? Yeah, he says, hit on the wood, the nail is gonna come out. I took the second option, did like this, and the hand ballooned. You gotta do this, you gotta try again. And up again the stranger came and somehow I got underneath an arm and a, and a neck or something and he says later that I pulled him up like Superman and up and over we went and we fell down on my back. He gave me this big kiss as I'm lying on my back and, and I said, I'm Brian. <laughs> and he said, I'm Stanley and that's how we met. It's a Stanley Premier. And with my hand still outstretched, his hand had all ballooned, black and blue, bleeding and all. This man took my hand, and he held his hand like this. And this man stared me in the eyes, and he told me something that I'll go to the grave with. This man said, he said, all my life I live as an only child. I always wanted a brother, and I find that man today. And his hand, he had a, a gash in his left palm. He took my right hand and did like this. And he rubbed these two hands together and he says, from today you're my blood brother. And this man put his hand around my shoulder. He says, come on, buddy, let's go home. Brian Clark risked his own life to save the life of a stranger. Okay. Against all odds, he and Stanley Premnath will shortly emerge safely from the stricken building. And it's not a moment too soon. Because within minutes, the unimaginable disaster of the morning will take an even more deadly turn. At 10.05 a.m., the South Tower of the World Trade Center succumbs to the overwhelming forces against it. It's like I had my guardian angel there, and there's nobody, nothing can bother me. No harm can come against me. And that's what came out of this whole thing. That there is a God, and He hears, and He intervenes. And he protects. And that is what came out of this whole thing for me. I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. There is God. There is goodness. And there is a guardian angel. This man here, Brian Clark. The only person that we would see in the stairs, the entire descent, was someone we met coming up the stairs on the 68th floor. He was a co-worker of mine named Jose Marrero. As we passed Jose, I said, Jose, where are you going? He said, well, I can hear Dave Vera up above. He's on the walkie-talkie. He's helping people. I'm going up to help him. I said, well, Dave's a big boy. He can get himself out. He said, no, no, no. He said, oh, I'm going up to help him. I said, well, I'm getting this fellow from Fuji Bank out. And he said, oh, no problem. He said, I'll be okay. 
and up he went. And of course, Jose died that day doing his good deed. One week after the event, this would be on the Monday night following, I fell into a dream in my bed. And in my dream, I dreamt that I was in my bed, which is a strange thing for me to dream, at least. But I dreamt that I was on my back with my head up off the pillow, staring at the foot of my bed. Now, I normally sleep on my left side or my right side, never on my back. But suddenly then, in my dream, to the foot of my bed came Jose Marrero, the man I had passed on the 68th floor, walking up. And Jose had a white, pure white, blousy type shirt. There was no tunnel of light, there was no flashing lights, but just this bright white shirt and his glorious smile. He was known for his smile. He didn't say a word. He just looked down at me and smiled. And wide-eyed, I said to him, I said, Jose, you're alive. That's amazing. How did you do that? You fooled everybody. So I'm talking to him, if you like, in, in current event terms. It's not like, you know, hey, let's go to a, the, the, the picnic or something. You know, I'm saying, wait a minute, you know, you shouldn't be here. You're dead, that sort of thing. Now, he didn't respond. He didn't say a word in the whole time we were together. He just smiled again and nodded. And the message he sent me in that smile and nod, so the message I absorbed, if you like, was a very casual, you'll figure it out. And I stared at him another second, and then I shook my head like this to clear the cobwebs, and of course in that split second he disappeared. But there I was in the position that I had been in in my dream, and it was so seamless other than the shake of the head that I sat up and I looked around the room, sort of said, how did he do that? Where did he go? And a second later, beep, 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 right beside me it was my alarm. Time to get up, 5.25 a.m. And I have known ever since that instant you know, when I sort of realized what had happened and, and was awake, if you like, that Jose is fine, uh, that, that, uh, that I'll be fine, all my co-workers are fine, that you and I will be fine. Um, God's plan is unfolding, as it should. And, and any doubts I had about my faith just evaporated in that moment. And, and I haven't had any nightmares. I haven't had any trouble falling asleep at night over 9-11. I have no survivor guilt. I am left with sadness that it happened, but that's all that I'm left with. I didn't tell you about Ron as well. I said Ron went back to the stairs and went up. Ron later told the story that he went as high as the 91st floor when he caught up to the heavyset woman and the rest of our colleagues, and they all lay down on the floor up there. That's where they sort of decided to stop and get fresh air if they could, lower to the floor. And people started to fall asleep was his description, and he heard a voice, get up, you know, just internalize this, and, and he, in that instant, got strength to get back up, he got his breath, um, and he just said, I had to see my wife and children, and he went back to the stairs, he's without a flashlight, and down, down, down the stairs, and he followed Stanley and I out of the building by a minute. He got caught just while, well, it was probably uh, two or three minutes after us, because he got caught as the building came down. He got blown across Church Street. He actually did go out a different exit than us, but got blown across Church Street and woke up in hospital two days later. Now, he's fine now, but uh, he was, you know, he was seriously injured at the time. Brian and I are running so hard, so fast. We ran, and all I remember doing was actually bump into this priest. The man had his hand folded like this, and he's just watching the spectacle, like a scene from a horror movie. And that's all I remember. The next thing I remember, I'm holding on to the fence of Trinity Church, the church I told him I'm going. I'm going to Trinity Church, I don't have a clue why. And I'm, we're holding on to this fence, and I'm telling Brian, you know, this building is going down. And we're watching this scene, and the next thing we know, it starts making some strange sounds, and the building starts imploding. One floor after one after one, tremendous boom. And all that smoke that was in the air and the cross street, as the building imploded, it created a vacuum. And it starts sucking the smoke from the cross streets and in the air towards the core. And all the people that we saw that was roped around blocks away, the smoke like a giant tsunami is just enveloping the people. I'm like, oh my God, what is happening? And the next thing I realize, Brian is no longer there with me. And this man who I'm holding on for support, I'm screaming, Brian, Brian, I can't hear him anymore. And I can't see him. 
and he's gone. Like, like this guardian angel who is sent here just to take care of you and his mission is over now and I'm by myself and I can't figure all this and in my head like like they're bombing the financial area I, I gotta go save my wife and I, and I can't rationalize it in my head and the first time in my life I became angry I mean really 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 angry what I can't understand is I just got delivered by a giant aircraft. It looks like a giant hands held up the building until Brian and I are in perfect safety, the building imploded. It looks like a hand just pushed the plane aside from me without actually coming straight towards me and, and just blew up in front of my face. And here I am getting angry. I'm, I'm angry and I don't know why, but I gotta go save my wife and Brian is not here with me. And even though I know where she works, I've never visited her. All I know is the building number. And she works over the Brooklyn Bridge. And I'm watching, looking for somebody, somebody to help me, anybody. And I'm looking for something and I don't know what. And I remember a man is driving a white 4x4 pickup truck. I don't know if I ever told you this. Mm -hmm. And as this man is driving, I ran alongside, hobbled, opened the door, looked at the man and says, one word from you, you're dead, drive. The man reached on top of his dashboard, pick up a white box of cigarettes and says, here, smoke. So no man, I had enough smoke for one day. So he looked at me and he smiled. I says, drive. So we're to Brooklyn Bridge. So he's driving on top of the sidewalks and everything. He reached the ramp of the Brooklyn Bridge. I opened the door, hobbled out, thank you, and I'm gone again. As I'm running on top of this bridge, I bumped into this big guy now. And I'm expecting him to take a swing at me. The man turns around, looks at me into compassion in me. The man says, my name is Albert. I don't remember his last name. He says, I'm a senior counsel for a French bank. Ask me for anything. I said, just show me the address of this building where my wife works. I told him the building number. The man said, I live right behind that building. What I can't figure out is, what are the chances for you to bump into that one man out of thousands of people and he knows exactly where that building is. What are the chances for me to say, Lord, I can't do this, you take over. And Brian is there with a flashlight waiting for me. And when I got to the lobby of this building, the security guard looks at me and in his mind, he probably says, this is one of the bad guys. He reached for his guard stick and he says, oh no, you're not coming in here. And I looked at the man and says, I don't have a problem killing you if I have to. I must see my wife. At this point, I'm crazy in my mind. I'm angry I just got delivered by God and I'm supposed to be happy. And here I am angry and I don't know why I'm angry. And I took a karate stand and I remember this man went to hit and the next thing I know, I don't remember what happened, but he is somewhere else. And the next guy saw what happened, the next security and he reached for his guard stick and I tackled both of them. And the man who was with me, Albert, he is making so much noise that the receptionist heard them looking for Jennifer in the legal department. And she picks up the phone, I'm looking at the corner of my eyes and I'm tackling these two guys, trying to make sure I don't get hit. And I saw a man running coming towards us. And as this man is running coming towards us, he pushed the security guard and said, what are you doing to Stan? He's a good man, oh my God. Stan, what happened? And I've seen this man just once in my life. And as this man got closer towards me, so oh my God, Stan, what happened? And this man took out his shirt and he says, here, take my shirt, Stan. And he turned to the security guards and the nurse who was there in attendance and he said, give this man anything he wants, but make him well. And I've met this man just once in my life at a Christmas party, my wife's boss. If the Bible was to be written in modern days, this man would have been the Good Samaritan. And the nurse came and said and took one of her jackets and said, here, Stan, take my jacket. The man said, give him anything he wants, make him well. But Stan, I got to go, we have an emergency meeting. And the nurse said, Stan, we don't have the facility here to take care of you. You need the hospital badly. 
said, no. If I can only speak to Jenny, I'll be fine. But I can't remember her home number. I'm crazy. He said, give me a phone. This right hand, I couldn't use much of it. So I took the left hand and I'm playing with the numbers. And a telephone number pops in my head. I told the nurse, can you dial this number for me? And she dialed the number. And I got the receiver. And here's Jenny on the other end. Who is this? It's me, Stan. What are you doing this for? What are you playing games with me for? Please don't do this to me. No, it's me, the Lord took care of me. I'm coming home to you girls. Please don't do this to me. Please don't do this. Please don't. My husband is dead. No, 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 no. The Lord took care of me. I'm coming home. And I hung up that phone. And I waited. And the train starts to run again. It was, it was a while after the nurse walked me down to the subway. And I remember she gave me an apple, a sandwich, a bottle of water. Just saying, I can't send you home with a cab because they shut down the expressways. And I took a train, another train, another train, and went back, made the connection to where I parked. When I got to my car, I realized it's an effort for me to put on the seatbelt now because I'm swollen. And I'm more scared of getting a ticket than anything else. I tried and I buckled myself up and with this one hand I reached and I shifted the gear and like a robot I drove all the way back to Elmont where we lived. I pull up in the driveway and all the neighbors are out and as they saw me they just ran and they hugged me. Thank God you're safe Stan, thank God. And they're hugging me and they're kissing me. So as I, as I walked in all the neighbors are standing up and they're watching me. I went and I reached down for my little daughter. And as I reach for Caitlin, the child starts to scream, Don't touch me, you're not my daddy. And she's hiding behind my wife. No, no, it's daddy. No, no, you're not my daddy. Please don't touch me. The child can't recognize me. When your own daughter can't recognize you, you reach that breaking point. And I reach for Stephanie. And I hug this child. And when I hug this child, this child looks at me, and the child had a butter knife in one hand. And the child says, Dad, said, if you didn't come home, I was going to kill myself. And when that child said what she said, after all that I went through, didn't mean anything. And all I remember after that, I'm lying down on a, on a bed and a doctor is leaning over me and the doctor is telling my wife, this man lost his mind. It may take a, take a year, a month or a day, eventually he would snap out. He's got no broken bones. I've given him tetanus shots and he's going to be fine. But he must be in a very calm, loving environment. And I can hear every word this man is saying, just that I can't respond in words. Because it looks like somebody just erased my entire vocabulary. And the next thing I remember, I'm sitting down on a couch. I don't remember what day. And I'm watching the news. I was watching the news. I'm seeing a plane coming towards this building. Last minute, the plane makes a tilt. And I'm saying to myself, that is, that is God's hand pushing this plane aside. And I'm reliving this whole thing like a dream in my heart now. Looks back in retrospect, I said, Lord, send somebody. And this man, in a dream, came and helped me out. And I'm remembering, like in a dream, I'm telling this man, this building is going down now. And this man said, Steel don't bend. And that's the last thing I heard before the building imploded. And the newscaster is going on. September is spelled with nine letters. 911 is an emergency number. And it dawned on me then that deliverance is spelled with 11 letters. 
So I decided to call to my wife, Jan, Jan, come here, come here. And she looks at me strange. He can talk again. So she stood there and she's looking at me and she stood a little distance like she's scared to come towards me now. And I don't know why she would be scared. And I says, can you bring me my Bible? So I had an old King James Version Bible with a zipper around. The pages are all falling apart. And I made a lot of notes, so I'm very comfortable in my Bible. I know exactly what to find where. So I'm searching down like crazy in my head. I'm looking for 911 because they're talking about 911. And I know in everything there is something about godly about what they're saying. And I'm looking for 911. They're talking about 911. I must find it in my Bible. And I stopped at Psalm 91 verse 1. And I'm reading. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I'm thinking. And I'm reading. And I'm going down. And he shall give his angels charges over thee. And I'm reading. And I'm going down towards verse 15. I think it's verse 15. And he shall call upon me. And I will answer him. Will be with him in trouble. And the verse goes on to say, With long life shall I show him my salvation. And the next thing I know, I fell asleep. All the pages of the Bible fell out because the book was loosing apart. And I got up. And I'm fine the next day. Except that I'm swollen. And I'm black and blue still. And I can't walk properly because I'm sore. I would know in my heart I would be fine. And gradually, 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 the swelling went away. All the black and blue were gone. My hand was healed up. My leg wound was gone. And it all happened and unfolded as if it was in a dream.